Okay, I messed this one completely up, folks. I was supposed to have this. My fault. <laughs> Well, Kufar, Akbar, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Cross and the Crescent Discussion Group. This is a live-streamed YouTube show done every Sunday afternoon to differentiate between the truth of Islam and Christianity. We're here from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. every Sunday afternoon, usually. Uh, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Uh, but if uh, you want to participate in today's show, shoot me an email at ericthekefer, all one word, at gmail.com. I have my Gmail open. I did have my Gmail open. I'll open up my Gmail if you want to participate in the show. I will send you the stream yard link. We are blessed and have a real treat today. Um, we have, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to squeeze this type of stuff in. Um, you know, with especially with all the news in the world going on today, uh, with Israel and that conflict going on there. Uh, but uh, what we want to do today is we want to uh, revisit some of these topics that we have previously discussed on the show. And we brought our good friend Mary Harb. You can't tell it's Mary because Mary's dressed up like she lives in Iran or someplace, uh, Afghanistan, because she doesn't want to get. Uh, she doesn't want to entice any men there. Um, but Mary is going to talk about um, Ptolemy and Makaraba. And we've all heard this, this sorry excuse of, of many Islamic polemicists before, where they've come out and they've said that, well, we have proof that uh, Mecca uh, existed prior to the seventh century. And here it is. It's Ptolemy, this uh, second century curator of the museum, or the library in Alexandria. Uh, he said he says it right here, Makarab. Well, is that true or is that not? Um, we have discussed on this show before why it's not true, but I was watching a presentation that Mary's going to do for us here a couple weeks ago that she did on uh, Thaddeus's show, Reasoned Answers, and I like it a lot. So what we're going to have Mary do is she's going to give that same presentation, if not better, because it's on the Cross and the Crescent discussion group. She's going to put a little more effort into it. I've already been sure of that. Um, and let us know what she has come up with as far as why Makaraba cannot be Mecca. Welcome to the show, Mary. How are you today? I am great. Now, <clears throat> starting out, Unlike some people, I do think that Islam started in Mecca. However, the entire story about primordial Mecca, this place that Abraham built and people visited for years and years and years, that's a lie, which means that Islam is false. Now, if you could move this Mecca some other place, you might be able to rescue it. Oh, oh, it's over here where Abraham might have possibly visited. No, it really is in the Hejaz, but it really didn't exist then. It was built later it was built far later and islam is a lie it's not 
that people got tricked by the Abbasids or by the Umayyads. It is just a lie that anything existed anywhere where anyone was doing any pilgrimage at the time of Ptolemy in AD 150. Nothing. There was no place like this. There was no one had the Black Stone. No one cared about the Black Stone. The Black Stone was just another one of 10,000 pagan pretty stones that the stone worshipers just chose one day as a local stone to prop up and carry around and stuff because it looked really cool. They saw a really nice stone and it was big. If, if, if they saw a stone and it was small, they'd use it to wipe their butts. If they saw a stone, it was like medium sized. If it was really pretty, they'd worship it. And if it wasn't, then they would use it to prop up their cooking pots. This is this is Islam, and the black stone is just another one of a million pagan beetles, they're called. B A E T L Y S. And there is nothing special about it, and it didn't even exist at this time. Nobody it was in the ground somewhere. Nobody knew about, nobody cared. Okay, so uh when you say these be this is something that they would be once they find these meteorites in the ground. Oh, they're not, it, it's not even a meteorite. That whole thing about being a meteorite, that's just a pretty lie. Oh, it's from heaven, so it must be a meteorite. No, it's just a pretty stone. Everybody who's looked at it close up has said that it does not resemble any meteorite in any way. It's too brittle. I think, no, I'm sorry. I, I think it's like uh, onyx or whatever, the volcanic glass. Yeah, somebody uh, said the, the main theories now are either it's agate or it's like glass. And perhaps it's the type of glass that sometimes occurs whenever a meteorite strikes sand and then the sand turns to glass. Mm -hmm. But there is no plausible uh, geologist who has gone, why, yes, this looks like a meteorite. All the geologists who have been able to get some kind of look at the little pebbles that are left have said that it's not. And, and it couldn't have broken like that. If it was an iron, an iron meteorite, it would not have broken the way it did when the Cardinations took it and threw it in their latrine where it belongs. So <laughs> the fact that it broke shows that it is not one of the meteorites like they predicted. Okay, so uh, let's get down to Ptolemy. What are you yep. going to tell us about Ptolemy? Well, if you can bring up uh, my presentation. Oh, that's right, yeah. Okay. Yep. Bring that, yes. Um, Oops, where'd it go? There we go. There so the is. question is, where is Mecca at this time? Now, the Islamic sources say where it ought to be. It's supposed to be existing. Supposedly, Abraham is constantly traveling to Mecca to casually visit his son and his, uh, his daughter-in-law, just one day he comes by and he's not in. So he just leaves, he goes back. And then another day he comes by and he's not in. And he he leaves again. He doesn't hang out because he's really close to it, right? He's really close to it. That is 750 miles as the crow flies or a thousand miles by ancient caravan roads. So- How many miles, um, whoa, whoa. would you say how many miles ancient caravan ride? So the, the caravan route did not yet exist at the time of, right. uh, of Abraham, but of according to the caravan routes that existed later, uh -huh. if you were going to Taif and then you were taking the, the bypass, essentially the small route through the mountains that's there, um, it would take you uh, 1,200, or excuse me, 1,000 miles. Or one thousand, or one thousand six hundred and twenty kilometers. Okay, and I thought you said seventeen hundred miles, and I was like, "What?" Wait a second. That, no, no, se seven hundred and fifty as the crow flies at a thousand miles. Right. As, if you uh, follow the roads. If you follow the roads, and actually, the uh, the modern highways almost all follow old roads, so you could actually see. Um, this one does not show the major road. It shows a weird kind of bypass that's now the major road because Jeddah is a really important city. But there is actually a road that goes from Taif straight up to that straight part to Medina right. without ever going through Mecca. Because, of course, why would you go through Mecca if you're going oh, you have from, to come off the plateau? Sure. Yeah, you're not going to climb. Yeah. Also, let's point out the fact that when uh, Abraham lived, 
was around 2000 BC? Uh, it, it depends on how, what particular, your, your particular chronology that you prefer. Um, either uh, 1950-ish, whenever he came out of Haran, or about 750-ish. Um, it depends on how you're reading the sources, or 1750-ish BC. And really the first evidence... You said 17? Uh, 1750 BC is the most recent, that's the shortest chronology. Uh, okay. And the highest right. chronology so is right. like right. 1,950. A 2,000 round number. So People yeah, 2,000 round number. Mine's but, around that better. But at th that time, there was not an established trade yet. That kind of shows up around 1400 BC is whenever people kind of first start coming up from Oman and of the, those places in Yemen up there. And then it's truly established by 1200 BC. So like so none of the roads. Would, another anachronism. Yeah, it, yeah, it would be something that didn't exist. All right. So there's something well, that didn't exist. That has to exist in order for this to be true. Yeah, and it's also just impossible distances. If you're going to visit your uh, son and you're traveling a thousand miles to do it, and he happens not to be in, you don't turn around and go home because his wife is the only one who's in that day. Like, you stick around. <laughs> and, what about the Barak? I mean, isn't that a reliable <laughs> mode of transport? <laughs> no, well, the Barak is only supposed to be, people say that making fun of the story, but the Barak, I, I yeah, is only supposed to be for Muhammad. So, who knew? It, I mean, it's just, it's a ridiculous story. And so people want to like kind of make the story less ridiculous by saying, well, maybe Islam started somewhere else. No, no, it really did start here. And the story really is that stupid. And it really is that untrue. And you can't find in any of the pre-Islamic poetry that is at all in any of the, the category that any person of any kind of like scholarly aptitude whatsoever believes to be legitimate. And how do None they get away? The, how, how do they get away with, with telling this lie then? If there's no if, if you're if you're an academic, how uh -huh. can you continue to support this or believe this if you if you can clearly show that Abraham had no ability to travel these great distances. At no the, academic at thinks this, though. They, they all agree that it's made up, unless you're a Muslim who just doesn't care about truth. Like, the, acad the academics will just go, yeah, it's made up. And in fact, it doesn't exist in the pre-Islamic poetry that they think is genuine, that there is no reference to Abraham whatsoever in that poetry in conjunction with Mecca. There's no Ishmael in conjunction with Mecca. That originates with Muhammad. Muhammad makes this up to say, no, we're a le legitimate. I'm totally a real prophet. And in fact, right. my place is the most important place in the world. And this is why. And he makes something up. So it's just, it's all fiction. So um, there are other traditions concerning the building of the house. The, the, the Kaaba is supposed to be scum on the primordial waters before anything else is created. And then the place of Mecca is the first place to emerge from the waters before the other earths. And well, Allah... Well, they got the scum part right. They got the scum yeah. part right. <laughs> and Allah builds it like in Jinnah. And then later, uh, apparently he takes that one away and it just goes back up and it stays and it goes back up to Jinnah. And then, and then Adam has to rebuild it. And then there's the flood with Noah. And then Noah's ark circles around the place. It does top off at, at the Kaaba that isn't there anymore. Whoa, it's where's this at? Is lifted this, away. All, all of this is in, if you go to uh, Al Tabari. Oh, it's he Tabari. Talks, okay. Yeah, he, right. he talks about all these things. Sure. Okay. And Al Tabari isn't as embarrassed by the stupid things that Muhammad said. And so he'll include a lot more of the stuff that got washed out of a lot of the collections because it is so embarrassing. So you won't find a lot of the most embarrassing and stupid things in like Bukhari or uh, Sahih Muslim. You won't find it there because it's been scrubbed out. 
But now after after uh, the time of Noah, it's gone for a while. And then, and then Abraham comes and builds it. And here's where it gets really interesting. It says that... Uh, uh, <laughs> here's the first house. So build me a house on earth, right? Abraham felt uneasy. So Allah sent the Sakina, that's uh, Shekinah, well, uh, as people like to say, Shekinah, right? right. Sure. Okay. Um, that's what it actually is. It's a borrowed word from uh, Hebrew. And he had no idea what it was. But he says, it's a gale force wind with two heads. And one head followed the other until they reached Mecca and coiled up at the side of the house the way the snake coils. Notice all this snake imagery. That's because the original Kaaba was dedicated to Wad, who was the god of the Minions. And the Minions were the first people to ever have a kingdom that included uh, the Hejaz. And they're known in uh, Ptolemaic sources, not this Ptolemy, but like Ptolemaic as in like the Egyptians, right? From the uh, second century BC, talk about the Minions and their outposts and how they control all the frankincense trade through the Hejaz. And they have uh, on the island of Delos, they have, there is a uh, standing stone with an inscription that's dedicated to Wad by Minions who traveled there and are like seeking safe passage and stuff. So their main god is this Wad god who is, his name means love, which means he's probably the husband of Al-Uzza um, because uh, Al-Uzza was the main goddess also of the Minions. And um, he is, his imagery is snakes and moons because the high God always had an association with the moon. It was just like the high God equals moon. Um, it doesn't mean that all the moon gods are the same, but rather our God is the high God. Therefore, he is the moon God, right? So we have all the snake imagery here, but it's, it's given with Abraham uh, and assigned to the Sakina. And it's like, uh, and then this, this, sacred snake shows him where to build it and then he builds it with the help of gabriel uh and then we have another story that is about the building which says that uh oh and this is uh this is a story of the zemzem well coming about etc cetera, etc cetera. um yeah, which makes all the sense in the world. Yeah, well, it's an excuse, right? They have this well that's inside their sacred place. Why should we keep this in our traditions? Because there was an enormous Hajj that was that had Mecca as like one of its main places because that was the place of their high god. But the route that included Mecca also included the shrine of Manat. It included the shrine of Al-Uzza. It included the shine of uh, Kuza, the archery god, who had a fire altar of some sort at the very border of Mecca. It had a lot. And this was just one stop. So we're getting rid of a lot of these things. Now, this and is 2nd century said, BC. Is this what you're saying, Mary? 2nd century BC stuff? So I'm saying that none of this is actually happening yet. It's not happening in the 2nd century BC. This okay. stuff is happening in Muhammad's lifetime, as he's walking around, he's saying, you guys need to stop going to this site and this site and this site. But this thing that appears to be just as pagan as everything else, that's okay. And there's actually this hilarious story of him walking by a tree that was one of the sacred trees that had a bunch of things hanging on it. And it might be the same as the shrine of Al-Uzza. It's hard to tell because there's Al-Uzza is three trees, and then they walk past this tree that has hung things on it, so it might be the same thing. And they're asking, and they turn to Muhammad, and they say, give us a tree like this tree. Basically, this is one of the pagan things that we want you to come up with an excuse to keep. And he says, no, 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 this one is not one of the things of Allah. So he's coming up with excuses to keep all these pagan things, and he's trying to trace them back to Abraham to make them authentically monotheistic. These have nothing to do with Abraham. These are just lies, right? So here's, you know, the, the lie of running back from Al-Safa and Al-Marwa, which had, they had idols on the tops of those in Muhammad's lifetime. 
and people were going from one idol to another and they were on the top of these stony outcrops that were themselves like even natural stone outcrops could be considered like sacred to these stone worshipers. And so he's coming up with the reasons. Well, this one's okay because we're just doing what Hagar's doing. And the Zemzem is okay. And it's super special and sacred because it totally was around at the time of Hagar and Allah gave it to Hagar. So these are all the excuses and trying to make these things ancient. And then at that time, and then it's, he claims that the tribe of Jurham is the tribe that came, it's a Kahatanite tribe, um, meaning that it's from one of the divisions of the Arabs that they kind of mentally divided themselves into that was more Southern, but they were actual Arabs. They were not South Arabians. They were Arabs and they spoke true Arabic. And they came, that means they came from the Araba, which is the Jordanian Hara, probably only about 300 BC. So now in his story, he's having people from about 300 who only exist in the Hejaz around 300 BC and later. And not even their tribe necessarily has an identity at this point, but but like people who who speak the language they speak the exact dialect that they're speaking that will then branch off to the different forms of Arabic, that they only arrive in the window of about 300 BC. And he is placing, because they're the, the oldest tribe that the, the community memory holds in their heads, he's mm -hmm. projecting them all the way back into 1700 or 1900 BC and saying that, oh, they went there back then because and it's completely anachronistic by like 1500 years or more. But he's taken 2300 years of history and condensing it into era, right. ma making it applicable only to his. This is why it's an anachronistic, is because he's what do they call it? Time compression is what it was. Yes. Yeah. Everything is hugely time compressed to people who are illiterate. They have like this horizon beyond which if you go past the horizon of memory, everything gets mushed together into, into this kind of er time where everything exists simultaneously in this vague sort of way and this is what you're getting here is you're getting people whose ancestors didn't even come to this area until about 300 bc and suddenly they're already here right mm -hmm. and so um so they and they also they're so recent that they think that most people that that the native Yemenis are Arabic speakers and they don't really know what to do with the South Arabian minority that very small minority by the time of, of the the seventh century right but they don't they don't know what to do with this minority in their minds um they they think that they're that it's properly like, Arabic speaking, but Arabic only replaced uh, the old South Arabian languages as the majority language in the window of like the first century AD. And then it slowly died out after that time and became less and less common. So all of this is just huge amounts of things that are just incredibly anachronistic and confused because they don't have any real historical knowledge. And, you know, well, tons of these details are probably totally made up by the Sahaba. The core that Muhammad told is probably being faithfully relayed here, and it's all a lie. So uh, the, the, the original gods, according to the Islamic tradition, the first, the primordial gods, and the primordial god list are mostly um, are mostly Yemeni. And so they do kind of remember that there used to be these gods in this area that then got replaced by these other gods who are mostly from the area of the Jordanian Hara and from uh, Nabatea and that region there where the, the Arab homeland rather than the South Arabian homeland. Okay. So there have been some recent really stupid polemics claiming that there's Mecca and the Bible 
And this is Psalm 84, which is, which were written by musicians who are after the time of David. And they're saying, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts, O Yahweh of hosts. My soul, soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of Yahweh. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Yahweh of, of hosts, my king and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing and praise. Now, where is this house? Oh, it says right here, blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose hearts are the highways to Zion. Right, right, this yeah. is all about Jerusalem. And exactly. yet they'll claim that this verse, as they go through the valley of Baca, they make it into a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. Well, this is a play on words. That well, uh, that's also, uh, that's one thing I because I've had a discussion with the guy about this verse. A little place. He's, yeah. he's, he's, he's trying to say that this, of course, is Mecca. Well, where and, are they going? Here's the question: Where are they going? They're, they're going, going to, to they're going to Jer they're going. Say that again. Yep. They're going to Zion, which is Jerusalem. Jerusalem, correct? Yeah. But what my question is is that if this is Mecca, if this is supposed to be Mecca, where are these pools of water located? Yes. I mean, this, it gets four inches of rain a year. There's no pools of water in Mecca. And, the, and of course, you, you you pointed out the fact that Zion always in the Bible means Jerusalem. So yes. this well, is just, it's well, another case people, of desperation. Yeah, these are musicians. These are musicians of Jerusalem writing about people coming to Jerusalem. And as they come to Jerusalem, as Jews come to Jerusalem, as Israelites come to Jerusalem, they come through the Valley of Baca, right? So they're saying that they are going from somewhere near Jerusalem down to Mecca right. on their way to Jerusalem. And that, that's supposed to be plausible to us. Just because there happens And then how long does it take to travel? How long does it take to travel? Uh, would, would that take to travel by foot? Do you, I mean, uh, that takes nearly calculated 60 that? days. It takes nearly 60 days. To go 2,000 miles. Well, to go to go that distance, the caravan the caravans took about sixty days to go from uh, Busra to uh, Mecca. So that was a sixty day trip. So they go sixty days outside of their outside of their way, just so that they can go through a place called the Valley of uh, Baca. And my question to them is, of course, they want to make it the Valley of Baca, right? Uh, is is Mecca a place of weeping and sorrow and it's terrible? Because it's these pilgrims' joy going through a place called the place of weeping that instead turns it into a joyful place of springs and pools. That's what's being said here. They're going through an awful place, a place that's generally awful, on their way to Zion. And because of their joy, it becomes a wonderful place. And instead of the water being tears, the water is now springs and pools. <clears throat> And no, and and it's funny because um, the 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 early, the Islamic sources will say that oh, in the time uh, before the Jurham, right before they covered it up, early on, Zemzem was such a bounty as well that everything was full of greenery and wondrousness, and yet the story is supposed to be that the Jurham covered up. Whenever the next group comes, the Khuza, which who don't come and only come about 350 AD, right? And that they cover up the well then. And according to the story, the Khuza, do you know what they don't do? They don't just uncover the well. They live for at least 20 years without any water whatsoever, because that's what one does. Whenever one comes to a place and somebody has filled in the well, one just lives there without any water whatsoever, not a single well. And you just magically exist on, on rainbows and dewdrops as this beautiful garden all dies. And that's what you get in the legendary Islamic sources that, 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 that supposedly they just, and they were, are supposed to be regular visitors to the site too. Like they're supposed well, to be okay, so, okay, and so they're supposed let's, to let's, let's, can, yeah. we back up to, can we back up to this, this, this Zam Zam well thing? So what you're saying is that, that Islamic polemicists or Islamic apologists today 
are insisting that the Zamzam well was able to provide enough water to provide for irrigation and the growing of food in Mecca? In in a couple of the sources that talk about the the, the Valley of Mecca at the time of Ishmael, right? Okay. It's so... supposed to be, but not at the time of in in the Quran, it specifically says that there is nothing cultivated that grows in Mecca and that you have to bring in all your food from afar. You cannot grow anything there. It says it very explicitly. It also says in the, um, it also talks about in the approved, um, the approved narrations in the Ahadith, right? Uh, in, in these Ahadith, it also says, look, uh, you know, it talks about how nothing grows there and nothing's cultivated there and everything's brought in. So in these fabulous tales that get included in folks and in works like um, Al-Tabari and like in Ibn Ashaq, in those works, you'll get some of the more ridiculous stories like this, that, oh, it, it became this wonderful garden because Zemzem was just flowing and wonderful and beautiful and stuff. So these are kind of like the later elaborations, sort of like even when you, if you go to Ibn Ishaq, for example, you'll see that in his work, Mecca is a very small place and it's pretty pitiful in the way it's built. But then if you go to the sealed nectar, suddenly it's this wonderful sprawling city type of thing is kind of the idea that's in it. So you have these layers of elaboration. And so whenever people talk about, you know, the wondrousness of Zemzem, it's like, well, why are you pumping in water that's desalinated from the seashore? It's because Zemzem never provided very much. And Zemzem did not exist at this time at all whatsoever. What Zemzem was in the time of Jurham was that it was a about six foot deep well that was dug for people to throw in their uh, their sacrifices to wad slash Allah, which, you know, like bracelets or money or those sorts of things so that it could be like covered over with rocks so that people couldn't steal from the holy shrine and stuff like that. It wasn't a water well until um, Abdul, Mut uh, Abdul Mutalib, he's the one who dug it out and hit some water, but the water tasted foul no one ever used it for drinking water. And during his time, it was steeped in raisin, dried raisins and figs were steeped in it to make it palatable so that people would, would want to drink it. But do you know what you call uh, it whenever you steep raisins and dried figs in water longer than about 12 hours? It makes wine. So... This kind of makes you question what the rituals were concerning the special Zemzem water. Um, there are all sorts of discussions about the wine that's made from steeped raisins and dates. And after Muhammad said, oh, you can't, you can't uh, soak it more than you know 12 hours. If you make it at night, you should drink it in the morning. If you make it in the morning, you should drink it in, uh, in the evening because it became alcoholic. So at this time, at the time of... When Muhammad's a kid, everybody's drinking this alcoholic drink made with the Zemzem water that otherwise tastes foul. It's so nasty that a later governor of Mecca called it the mother of black beetles because he thought it tasted <laughs> like smashed bugs. So I think I, I can't remember who was it uh, was on the show and they had talked about drinking from the Zamzam. Well, maybe it was well, Al-Fadi had mentioned this. Drinking from the Zamzam, well, they they add like a, a type of flavor to it today. Uh, I Maybe it was. Maybe yes, it was, they no. do. Yeah. They, they, well, also they pump in tons and tons of water from the right. uh, ocean that's been desalinated sure. and then they make it taste really nice and sweet. Right. So you feel like it's special. But people used to think that like nasty tasting water was medicinal or had magic properties because of it too. It's just a common thing in human history that if you have like this really mineral 
tart, awful water that people will think that it's like good for them. So the biggest, the, the, they have, so Muslims have attempted to find Mecca because Mecca during all this time, it's supposed to be built by Abraham. And then tons and tons and tons of people are supposed to be going to it every single year from the time of Abraham to the time of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. That is the narrative. So it needs to exist. Even if there's not nobody living there as permanent residents, it should be pretty darn famous if all these tribes are visiting this place every single year. And so they want to find it in any of the discussions of locations or history or whatever that exists uh, in, in written work. Because, of course, at this time, the people of the Hejaz were writing like they, they didn't write at all for a long time. And when they finally started writing, they would write like nothing of interest to literally anyone. Um, they would write their name and that they were missing someone. <laughs> and that would be it. Not very helpful. So you need to go to outside written sources to find any kind of reference. So the first place that they'll go to is Ptolemy. And they, uh, and with Ptolemy, uh, they say that they have totally found a Mecca in Makoraba. Now, the interesting thing is that this claim didn't actually come from any Muslims. It it came from Westerners who were try who at least they they thought that the Islamic narrative would have some semblance of truth. And if some place has been said to be the most sacred place for all their people for hundreds and thousands of years that they expected to actually find at least hundreds of years before. And so this was first, uh, I think it was in the 16th century. Was yeah, first right around there forward. where they introduced it, right. Yeah, yeah they, they first put forward it as a theory. Now, a ton of other places have been suggested too because uh, Europeans just didn't even know <laughs> where Mecca really was. And the Renaissance... So they would just suggest places like vaguely in Arabia. Um, and But this is the one that kind of stuck because it seemed more plausible than any of the rest of them. So the, the original explanation for why it's called Mako Raba was that Raba means the great in the Northern Semitic languages and that the great sailors of Phoenicia were in fact in, in cooperation with, uh, they were in cooperation with Solomon and were down at, um, at the southernmost uh, port on the Red Sea of Solomon and helped build some ships. So from that, from that one piece of information, this person supposed that because Phoenicians have colonies elsewhere. Perhaps these Phoenicians made colonies along the Red Sea as well. And so their language came to be there. And that's why it's called Mecca the Great, Mecca Raba. Mm -hmm. um, but no, <laughs> that, well, that's made up. Phoenicians never had colonies there. Um, though they helped Solomon build boats they, they never had any colonies down there and never settled there. And their language did not become embraced there. And you don't, and Raba does not mean the great in Arabic. Uh, it's, it, it's a different, different root that means that. So that etymology does not work at all. Have you uh, read, I'm sorry for interrupting, but that's mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of a, a point to follow as far as the etymological origins of this word. Have you read what, uh, 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 what's her name? Patricia Corona has. I've read some of her stuff. She made some good points, but she doesn't. She was working on what they knew in the 1970s about the religious landscape of the world. So she had no idea what the uh, religious landscape was actually uh, like in uh, the Hejaz in those areas at that time because the work just hadn't been put in yet. So little because the Muslim world is so backward. So little study had been done of any of the historical sites in that area at that time. So, um, well, what I'm, I'm I'm talking about specifically the origins of 
when, when we look at the, the origins of the name Mecca and the origins of the name Makaraba, she says there's just there's nothing there that would that would when when we start looking at the 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 language itself, there's nothing that ties the two together. Period. Uh, there there isn't in terms of anything that's easily explicable. Um, like there there is no etymological movement link from one to the other. So the first one was a non-starter that's Maka Raba. It's just not, not, not possible. Right. Um, oh, but okay. so I'm getting ahead of you. Sorry, I'll keep my mouth shut. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here is the best argument that can be made for it with a plausible, a plausible uh uh root or connection, right? So it is, it would have first been under Yemeni control. Um, although people who lived there for as far back as we know, they spoke ancient North Arabian languages, the power that first controlled this in a state-like manner was in fact the Minians, and they spoke a South Arabian language. And the knowledge that Wad was extremely well known there from, from all the different sources, um, and all the snake and moon elements and all of that being dominant there, are... Uh, you know, are suggestive of there might be this Yemeni connection. The Islamic sources do believe that Mecca's first uh, owners were connected to Ye Yemen, although they don't know that the Jodham were not, in fact, Yemeni natively. Um, but what they suppose is that you go to this root MKRB, which in the Yemeni language is a legitimate word. Uh, we think that it is uh, vocalized makrab and means temple. It would be the passage of C, the root CRB, which means carry on, carrying out an obligation. So it would be a place of carrying out an obligation, which was just a neutral name for a temple. So is makkah from makrab? Well, rab as like a word at all didn't exist in Arabic yet. Maybe people who didn't speak South Yemeni began to call it Mecca. Maybe, right? Um, uh, in addition to the early etymology that wanted to make it Maka Raba the Great or Maka of Al-Rab, Maka of the Lord, uh, the, the Lord also didn't exist in Arabic at this, at this early stage in 150 AD. Uh, it would be borrowed later. Uh, from Hebrew or Aramaic, so it's just not linguistically possible. So this is really only the linguistic possibility. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe so, but does that mean that that's what it is on this map? No, we also have to show whether or not it's plausible that it's on the map, even if it were called this. So now hold on before we before before you touch that. Mm -hmm. Can you go back a slide where you had the map up there? Okay, where it says this is Ptolemy's map. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that we don't have. Okay, so people are. Map. They, yeah. You know, they, they, we have locations because he was the first one to kind of use the uh, meridian mapping technique. So, but we really don't have a map per se from Ptolemy. So, what Ptolemy did is that he gave longitude, well, he drew a physical map. <laughs> and then after he drew the map, he calculated out the longitude and latitude for other people to draw it later on because he knew it would be much harder for people to copy his map than it would be for people to copy the huge lists of places and where they all are. So what this is, is a more recent map drawn from his latitude and longitude. And you uh, notice I, I have here Egra misspelled, or uh, uh, it should have been Egra, not Erga, but Egra. Um, someone who was created when the, the person who created this map created it, he just like decided that the transcript or the, the manuscript of Ptolemy that we have now that says, um, uh, Egra, they must have just forgotten, uh, Najran. And so he like decided to shove it in there and the thing that had the closest spelling to it, but that's just something this map maker did. I chose this particular map just because it is the easiest to read and the clearest, but they all end up looking pretty much the same because they have the same latitude and longitude markers. So if people are going- um, 
let's look at this map. Oh, it's not there. Let's look at this map. Oh, it's not there. They're all being drawn from the same set of descriptions. So unless you get a map maker going wild here and changing things around because he thinks that there's an error in what he has, they'll look pretty much the same. A uh, question. Um, so this map that you're showing, is this from before um, Muhammad or after? Long if you already before started Muhammad. Approach. This is this, oh, this is, is before Muhammad. This is 150 AD. It's Ptolemy's map. It's the first time where there might be a Mecca. But I'm going to show you that the Mecca on this map is not Mecca. Like the Makaraba is not Mecca. It, it, it isn't. Um, hey, Makaraba. Yep. Sounds like so a song. Hey, here, here are a bunch oh, of places that are probably familiar to you. For example, Petra is a familiar place. Uh, Faran is in the Bible, or Par Paran in the Bible, right? Uh, these are the Thamud people in the Quran. This is Duma over here, Dumat al Jandal in Arabic tradition. There is Tema here. Um, this is Egra, which is uh, Al Hijr in the Quran. And Lathripa is, is Yathrib. So there are a bunch of places we can recognize. And there are these tons of other places that no one really has any idea where it is. Some of these other ones can be identified, but a huge number of these, nobody has any idea what he is putting on that map. Nobody's figured it out. So, um, but, but it does show it south, but it shows it to the east and not to the west. Um, but we'll we'll see what's kind of going on here and why this kind of ended up happening. So against the possibility that Makro Raba means Maka is the basic etymology. There are serious issues with even the way it's written in uh, in Greek. So there are some consistent changes that are made. They're kind of unique to Ptolemy's map, like switching things around in certain ways, but this is not one of them. The uh, the cough, what you would expect to be chai. You would not expect it to be kappa. Kappa, you would expect to be the Arabic, I'll just say, uh, Q here. So this written, even though, <laughs> even though we, we do write the kappa as a K whenever we write it from, from Greek to English, the Greek to Arabic parallels are different. So you would expect the, the consonants of Makoraba to be M-Q-R-B. Now, initially you go like, oh, Q-R-B, that is a great tri, I keep writing trilateral, triliteral root, because it can mean sacrifice. So M-Q-R-B would be a place of sacrifice. Oh, awesome, no. It only means sacrifice to a word that's borrowed from Hebrew in Muhammad's time. It was borrowed basically by Mohammed from the Jews that he hated so much, right? It had no previous attestation with that sense in Arabic or South Arabian. That's a dead end. QRB only means draw near. It's not used with that religious sense in Arabic at that time. So some other people try even more outlandish etymologies. None of that works. So we're already in trouble because what we thought was MKRB, which gives us our MK for Mecca instead is MQ. <laughs> Another thing that's against it is just the location altogether. Now, it's obviously not in the right place because it's clearly on a plane here. It's not in the mountains or below the mountains, like it's up on the plateau. That's not where it belongs. Um, it's also e east of Yathrib, not west. That can be forgiven because he's not that precise, but it being on the plane is kind of mess pretty seriously messed up. Um, the Betius River is the only river shown in all the Hejaz in this map. Where is there a river anywhere in that part of the Hejaz? Rather, the 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 the, the uh, wadis down in Yemen are way larger. So if you're expecting, if you're like, hey, the entire coastline only has one river, no one would say that that would represent something that is in that kind of Hijazi area. 
they would go, no, that has to be in Yemen because that's the only place there are uh, wadis of any considerable size that flow much of the year. That gets a lot more rain than the Hejaz does. So then that leads to another point. Yemen and Oman are both extremely stretched and made far too large. Um, the empty quarter and the empty parts of the Hadra Mount are basically erased by Ptolemy's map. He just shrinks all the empty spaces down. He doesn't think they're big empty spaces. Um, so it seems most likely that this Makoraba is actually in Yemen. So even if Makoraba refers to a temple village like a Makrab, it's probably it, somewhere. Mary, in I hate to interrupt you, but how far, how much further south is Yemen than where Makarab is located on this map? I mean, we're talking six hundred so, miles, five hundred miles. So it is about it is a massive distance, but Ptolemy erases like it, he erases all of these empty places. Everything that's empty gets shrunk down. Right. Notice and it, and how, this is the point that Ptolemy did not understand the vast size of the Arabian Peninsula. No, and we will find out and, why he got misled. Okay. So right, if he's reading from Strabo and yeah. is believing him, and I'll, I'll explain what Strabo wrote that made him think that, no, there aren't these empty spaces. There are these towns all right next to each other. Because the whole thing looks like this. Town after town after town after town. And sometimes he lists the same town in multiple locations because he's just putting them all in because it just seems too empty to him otherwise. No, it's it's really that empty. He just doesn't grasp it. Um, this Makaraba is also not called a metropolis. So he lists specifically which towns are larger and he calls them metropolises. And he does not call this Makaraba a metropolis. Um, and even Yathrib is not called a metropolis, but Yathrib was called Medina by the people, by the Muslims. It only had like 3,000 people there, but to the first Muslims who got there, it was a big city. So they were coming from somewhere much smaller than that. So, but but even Yath, uh, Yathrib is not called a, a metropolis in this and not viewed that way by uh, Ptolemy. So, um, now, here is the smoking gun that proves that this is, in fact, in Yemen. So the first big smoking gun was the fact that this, there's this Betius River that is the only river shown there. And everyone would go, this has to be in Yemen. If there's only going to be one river, it has to be in Yemen. Well, guess what? I spent, I can't tell you how many hours looking at city after city after city after city trying to figure out where they are. Well, guess what? Karna is uh, uh, Karnawa or Karnu, and it is the capital of the Minions. Remember I've been talking about these Minions? <laughs> so this, and this is, notice it's spelled with a kappa, so you would expect a Q whenever you go to, uh, if you're transliterating from Arabic to English, you'd expect the Arabic letter when transliterated to English, it's a, a kaf, but you would expect it to be a, uh, a Q rather than a K, and in fact it is. This this karna that they have here is uh, Karnawa, which is the capital of the Minions, and uh, Strabo, and I have remembered Strabo because my folks who've been listening to my strengths have already heard about his, uh, the the uh, Etius Gallus's campaign down to that area. But uh, he says that the troops that were trying to invade Yemen, they began at the White Town. And that's a port in the kingdom of Nabatea. It's the Nabataean port that they actually owned, Gaza, and that's on the Red Sea, the Gaza on the Mediterranean, they were just kind of allied with. Um, they marched, the army of uh, uh, alias Gallus marched from there to an unnamed city for a certain number of days that was also controlled by the kinsmen of the Nabataean king. And that's, and I misspelled it again. I cannot spell for the life of me. That's Shame Hegra, which is written, was written as Egra by Ptolemy as written as Negron here because the mapmaker decided it had to be there. Um, and then he 
blames the guide that it took them so long to get there. Uh, not really all that plausible. But then they march 30 days out of that land and then 50 days to Najra, which is somehow completely missing from the map. That's why this map maker wanted to add it back again, <laughs> even though he shouldn't have. He just tried to add it where he thought, because it's a major city, right? Um, and then they march six more days to the river. Hmm. Where is the river? Oh, yeah, it's the first river mentioned in here. It's the only river on the map. That would be our buddy here, Betius River. They campaign around those cities, including, including to Karna. It is called the largest city of the Minions by Strabo and is described after they arise in Najran as being around that river area. Um, and all of these places that they're marching were, uh, some of them aren't easily deci decipherable, but they all seem to be probably within a nine day march of Najran. And then they, he man they managed to march very fast up to the port of Hegra in 60 days at the end of this. Okay, can I can I add something to what you're saying here, Mary? Yes. It's, it's very important to understand the preciseness of Strabo. When they are on this expedition with Galus, they're starving to death. So what they would be doing is they would be going through every known village, hamlet, tent, whatever that they could find to find food to feed their army. And Strabo would be recording that along the way. And if you notice the route that they took, that Strabo took, it goes right through that region where Mecca is, is located today. And Strabo, along with, you know, Argathats, or, 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 uh, Agatharthes and all kinds of other uh, uh, cartographers prior to him and explorers prior to him, lists that area as being uninhabitable. So as Strabo's going through there and they're coming to through, bringing this army through that region, he's listing it as you can, the people can't live there. So they're not going down there and, uh, and, and looking because nobody's mentioning this city of Mecca. Now this campaign takes place. When, when is this campaign? Is this like the second century? Uh, 20, no, it's uh, the, the campaign is in 24 BC, only six years okay. after they took uh it's the the governor of egypt wanting to conquer this too okay so, so Ptolemy is getting later. this information he's getting this information from strabo now all and keep in mind Ptolemy is the curator of the uh the alexandrian library he has access to all of these writings so when he starts writing out where his uh, describing these locations on a map he has access right. to all of the greatest writings including Strabo's. So here, Nobody here's, mentioned this Mecca place. Go yeah. Ahead. Well, here, here's the issue. So Strabo was saying that their guide was misleading them and leading them away from every right. town. And that's why it took so long. But it, it really is not, I mean, maybe, maybe a little bit, but really the things were that far apart. But since Strabo was saying, no, this is the fault of this guide, Ptolemy's like, oh, these places are all really close to one another. And so he takes out all those empty spaces and all those empty marching days where they didn't find anything because he just believes that they're being kind of led just out of sight of all these towns. So that's why this map looks the way it does, because of the way Strabo was writing. He, because he was patronized by Elias Gallus. And if he said... Alias Gallus was not prepared and he marched his army deliberately through an entirely empty area and then it would make his patron look really bad. But his patron said, no, no, he misled us and we had no idea where things were and we had no ability to find it. And it's his fault that so many people died and that we couldn't find enough water and that we couldn't supply for ourselves, right? So this is... This is the, you know, this is what's happening here. Now, since Karna was described very clearly by him as the capital of the largest city of the Minions, uh, Strabo says this explicitly, and that is absolutely true. What we found in archaeology that uh, uh, Karnawa, 
Karnawa is in fact the Minian capital, then this Makaraba is to the south of the Minian capital. Minian capital, they are a kingdom of Yemen. So Makaraba is to the south of the largest city of a Yemeni kingdom. It mm. must be in Yemen. It cannot be anywhere else. When Ptolemy was drawing this, he believed that, that, that this was part of Arabia Felix, Happy Arabia, Yemen, that it was there. He did not think it was in the Hejaz. He didn't even think that the Hejaz really existed much. He squeezed it all out. You go from Yath, uh, from Yathrib straight to Karna, like two days journey there in his map because he believed Strabo's story that they were just being tricked and misled. So, Andrew, no, uh, Metra is, is not on the same road from Lot City. Um, he is, they are not saying, uh, the Quran says that whenever you're going up to Syria, you pass by a pillar of salt, right? He's not saying that whenever you're going, like, right out of the door or whatever. He's not saying that at all. We don't even know whether or not it's true. He just believes that it is. So um, there, there are lots of lots of misinformation about what the Quran is actually saying, and we have to read it for what it really says. So, um, and I, here is something that shows you <laughs> where that capital city is. It's right there. Ma uh, Ma'in there is the Minions. That's another word for it. It's the northernmost of these kingdoms. All of this is in German. Sorry, guys. But this, a lot of the stuff is in just transliterated into our Latin letters, so it's fine. But uh, you see Ma'in there being the northernmost next to Saba. Hemiar is already growing in this particular era next to Kataban, etc. So Karna, this Makoraba, is south of the Karna. So Makaraba is absolutely on this map located in Yemen and nowhere else. And it's deliberately located in Yemen by Ptolemy. And he knows that that's where he's putting it because Strabo describes it as being the largest city of the Minions and the Minions are in Yemen according to Strabo. So there's no question that that city is in Yemen. There's also something very interesting because there is a town called Al Makrab mm -hmm. that is in Yemen to this day. And it's not that far from Najran. Now, it is actually north of ancient Karma or uh, Karna, but it isn't very far north of it. So if he's just trying his best and his, his geography is awfully messed up for for most of this area just because he has so little information um that it's it's not at all there is a i don't know how old it is i don't know when it was founded i can find no information but there is al makrab in yemen so it could just be a place where there happened to be a temple at the time that he for some reason knows about somebody told him about so is that your that's your conclusion then? So, is that Nakarab is uh, located in Yemen? Let's see. Uh, we're almost almost done. Okay. So more against Makaraba being Mecca is that uh, that there are issues about the other cities and tribes that it does and doesn't have. It doesn't have Thamud, or it does mm -hmm. have Thamud rather. I showed you there. It does have Thamud. It doesn't have Jeddah. And it doesn't have Taif. Taif, okay. Taif, absolutely, is founded before there is any reason in the world for there to be a a uh, uh, Mecca there. And Jeddah, like, where would you? What would you be going to across? Why would you be going down at that particular place to the coastline? Who do you want to trade with if you're taking this? trip off the main road to a side road who are you trading with jenna probably has something to do with it and the other tribes that are in that area but they're not listed um 
Durham is not even listed yet. Uh, it would be listed in a fifth century by Stephen of Byzantium and his Ethnica. He lists Durham, but uh, he, he doesn't know about it here. Where's uh, Thakif? And they're the ones who control Taif. I think it's Thakif, actually. I think it's a long I. Um, so the tribe that controls Taif isn't there at all. Dayton isn't even there. Do you so mind if I ask a quick question? I'm Go so ahead. sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. So from the conclusions from your research on this, do you think that basically a lot of this information, like in movies they do this thing called re retro continuity, where they basically say, well, there's this story that existed that never actually existed. And then they, you know, like, like there's a story in one movie and then the second movie kind of changes the story of the first movie and says, hey, I'm going to insert all this information that wasn't actually in the first movie. That's the idea of the retcon. I'm just explaining that. So do yes. you think that all of these cities and all of these, these, this story basically was kind of put into a story that really actually never existed? So I think that all of the, Mecca being super ancient was retconned by Muhammad. I do believe that Muhammad mm. was born in the Hejaz in Mecca. I believe that it was an insignificant little backwater that had not existed uh, as a permanent settlement where anyone lived full time for even 200 years. Interesting. And had was probably originally set up whenever the Minions went someplace, they would set up places to worship Wad and to ask Wad for protection, like wherever they went. So it was probably a Betel or a beetle that was erected by the Minions, but nobody lived there in like the 200s AD. And then eventually in the 400s, Muhammad's own tribe decided to make it this permanent location. And there was this effort. So polytheism as such was dying at this time. And there was this effort to legitimize polytheism in the face of the onslaught of Christianity coming in and, and changing what everybody believed in. And what Muhammad's tribe was kind of trying to do what, and what the other people on the Hajj circuit were and a couple of other like rival Hajj cir circuits that would fight against each other and stuff. What they wanted to do is say, hey, look, you're saying that you should worship your God because he's the creator. Well, guess what? Our God, our high God is the creator. And our high God, yeah, he created everything, including these other gods. These other gods are also intercessors and they should be worshiped too. And so we have this new syncretic pantheon where we claim things about our high God that, that you say is true about the God of Abraham, essentially. And, and that's true about our high God. But our religion is a religion for the Arabs. These, this is the Arab God, the Arab religion, the Arab deen, the Arab uh, law and tradition and culture and all of this stuff. And when Muhammad first came around, he actually was trying to be basically more Jewish, Christian-y sort of thing. And he initially only called his God Al Rab and Rahman, and only later started using the term Allah, and only later started adding in more of these pagan elements whenever his people rejected him really, really hard at first. So, um, you, you don't, according to the best of the Islamic sources, the ones that people aren't getting really goofy with these super legendary things and all of this other silliness. What it says about Mecca in the fourth century, or excuse me, fourth century, they're not even there, in the fifth century and the sixth century, that they lived in round or oblong mud huts without even roofs until the sixth century. And in the sixth century, the first person started putting roofs on a house. And then later in the sixth century, the first person built uh built the first oblong house with like square corners and stuff 
Who says and, this, Mary? I'm sorry, I didn't catch who. who who's who's the source for this? Who uh, you can find it, for example, in uh, Kitab Mecca or Kitab Akbar Mecca is one. You can find it in uh, a number of other sources. Talk about this this occurring uh, and these various people who introduced things. There was one tradition that said that uh, square houses weren't even introduced until. Uh, Uthman, but that doesn't one seems kind of unlikely. But there are they there were uh, Majid Robinson did a great study on the number uh, that there were only 130 Meccans. They so the later the later people were absolutely obsessed with making genealogies, right? And the biggest of these genealogies that's the most thorough because everybody wanted to trace themselves back to Muhammad's tribe if they could, because then they would have like super special uh, status and stuff. There were only 130 men of Muhammad's generation, which means that if you're talking about like the genetic families of these guys, that's like 550 people or so. Add in some slaves, add in some clients, add in some peripheral small settlement. You're at like 775, maybe. You're way under a thousand people. When Muhammad gets to Medina, he does not trust uh, latrines. He's terrified of latrines because his people have never used a latrine before. And it isn't until 620, after 627, somewhere between 627 and 629, that his followers first start using latrines. Because in 629, uh, there, there were some folks who, con who converted to Islam because basically they were starving out in the countryside and the Muslims fed them because it was a big uh, time of drought. And they uh, were causing problems because of their poop being so numerous in the city, uh, in, in Medina, city in quotes, right? And a paradise about, right there. Yeah. That well, sounds there, like San, stuff, that's, San, that's San Francisco. So, yeah. <laughs> why, why did the, why did the, uh, uh, Aya of, uh, of, uh, veiling come down, of hijab come down? It came down whenever the women would go out to go poop at night, men would harass them. And like Umar was stalking Soda, right? He was stalking one of Muhammad's wives and sexually harassing her as she was trying to poop. Um, later yeah, because that's, that's just sexy. I'm just saying to no man well, ever. Here's you know. the thing. There's this very established tradition in Arab society of nightly assignations. Like you'd go out at night and have sex with people. So there would be young men loitering around trying to look for women who might be receptive to their advances or might just be able to be grabbed and dragged in the bushes or whatever. And even Wait, today- what's that called? Wait, what's that called? Uh, well, I said that it was for, it, it was a tradition of nightly assignations. So nightly like- as, Oh, assign, okay, I get it. Okay, like like day, uh, sexual meetings, right? Right now, mm. if you talk to anybody who has fought in Desert Storm, and they were near villages at night, and they had their night goggles, they will tell you that what they see are men going out to have sex with boys in the bushes all over the place. And that's because this tradition existed from that time. It just used to involve women too, but now they have latrines or flushing toilets, and women don't go out anymore. But Muhammad did not have latrines for his people until like, until sometime after the affair of Ifk, which was the affair of scandal where Aisha got accused of something in uh, 627, she was still having to go out to the, the field to poop because they didn't have latrines yet because Muhammad hadn't gone over his fear of latrines. That's how backward this dude was. You cannot relocate these people to a place of civilization. These are not civilized people. Nor do any of, does any of the Quran reflect first, like a, having the text in your hand? 
They don't know the names of any of the wives. They don't get the details of anything right. They mix up chronologies constantly. They miss, they mess things up. When Muhammad is asked, is called on the seven sleepers of Ephesus, and he's asked how many there were, he's like, oh, some say there were three, and some say that there were five, and some say there were seven, but only a few know. Well, apparently Jibril is not one of them, and Muhammad certainly wasn't, because he was never told. If he was hearing from Allah, you would think he would know, but he would also know if he were in a society where you had copies of these things where you could read it, and it says seven or eight, depending on which tradition, it would say something, and then you could speak authoritatively. He asked, you know, how long, and he couldn't come up with the length of time either, because he didn't know. He's telling everything from the second and third hand courses. And that's why the Quran is such a disaster and such a mess. <clears throat> he actually puts the Midians after the fall of Hegra and after the fall of the, uh, of Imran, uh, the seven pillars, uh, Hud's location. <coughs> and that's like, a thousand plus years off, right? Complete disaster. So this is not the product of civilized people or knowledgeable people or anything. It, it, it is the product of a dude who's repeating stories that he heard and messing them up. The, the, the Quran is stupid and it's a product of stupid people. <laughs> One stupid person who said a bunch of stupid things and other people who tried to cover for him but could only do so much because everyone regarded it as sacred. So um, so it's also important to know how unimportant, this is a real place, it's unimportant, but it was retconned by Muhammad to be the most important place in the world. Yet it can't be. Nobody's heard of it, right? Um, other cultures. But wait, on. but wait, wait, hold on, Mary, hold on. Don't you know, Neil Armstrong went to the moon, <laughs> and and right when the right when the moon was right over Mecca, he heard the call to prayer, and he became a Muslim, and then when discovered the crack in the moon, how, how can you argue against such evidence? I'm just saying. Uh, my goodness, you convinced me there. <laughs> That is truly an argument worthy of Muhammad's intellect. I'll put it that way. And they make it all the time. Yes. Um, so, yeah, other cultures have no idea about Mecca either. So I already talked about Stephen of Byzantium. And he has this geographical dictionary, which is called the Ethnica. Has Thamud. It has Jurhum in it. Finally, that shows up. Has the Minions. Has Medina. Uh, Yathirpa. It has no Mecca, no Mecca Mac Rabbah or Quraysh because they're totally unimportant and insignificant. Procopius, um, and he's from uh, uh, Caesarea Maritima, which is, it's the port that Herod the Great built, right? So he's like sort of in the region, kind of, right? He knows nothing of Mecca, nothing of Mecca Rabbah. He knows nothing of the Quraysh. He writes of Aksum's conquest of Yemen. So he knows about that. Um, and he believes that the whole of the Hejaz is under the dominion of the Hemurites, uh, whom Aksum conquered in his, in his description, right? Um, now, that would have likely been the case, except for those who pass under the notice of the powers because they're so insignificant. So the Quraysh are very proud of being uh, uh, Laqab. Or Lakah, not Lakab, <laughs> or Lakab, but Lakah, I wrote that wrong, uh, which means that they were not the clients of anyone. And uh, they didn't have client tribes that were free from all clientage systems. And the only reason that they could possibly be free is if the major powers didn't care that much about them. Because the, uh, because the, uh, Oxum, when it had conquered Yemen, it did successfully cause all of the tribes that had been warring and various things and uprising and stuff to fall back in line and become under them again. That's why the Meccans thought that Abraha is coming with his elephant against Mecca. He didn't know about Mecca. Or if he did, he didn't care. He was going against Banu Amr, who are the people he actually cared about because they mattered. 
Mecca that he walked right by, he did not care about. And that, that campaign was completely successful. He was utterly successful in that campaign with what he set out to do. And what he did not set out to do is come to Mecca because he didn't care about it. Um, so Mecca was established. If you, if you take the ages of the people from Kusay onwards, literally, and they might be a bit wonk, they are a bit wonky, but the earliest date that you can get for the establishment of Mecca as a place where people lived year round is 430 AD, no earlier than that. And sometime, for a short while before that, some local tribes came and worshipped there. That's all you get. Now, there are three ways of approaching Islamic sources. This is a fideist approach where you just affirm whatever just because your sources say it. Doesn't matter how contradictory it is. Doesn't matter how ahistorical it was. Yeah, Midian's supposed to come after things that happened like 1,600 years later. But that's fine. The Quran says it's fine. Um, and then there is the trail mix approach, and that's where you believe that the Islamic sources are mythologized aggregate that occurred through natural processes of different interest groups, and you pick out the uh, obvious additions and try to determine uh, which what remains is history. So essentially, imagine that you had a big old bag of trail mix that was made a long time ago, and that was left out, and a bunch of mice and rats got into it, well, ate a lot of it, left their poop everywhere. If you dump out that mix and you pick through it, you can do a pretty good job of figuring out what was in it before the rats got to it, even though you're still not going to eat it, right? And this is my basic approach to it, because there are a lot of things in it that do have explanatory power, far more explanatory power than any of the alternatives that have been offered. However, there are a lot of things that are very obviously the rat droppings, and I'm not going to accept the rat droppings just because there are things that truly do have true explanatory about, right? And then the third approach is the fully mythological approach where everything in Islam is made up ex post facto from whole cloth by a central authority. And I don't think that that one is plausible because if an authority had the power and resources to completely make up something totally new and get a bunch of people to believe that they have always believed it, then you would certainly have the ability to make up something that is less awkward and stupid, more coherent, more cohesive, that where the Quran would actually say something like, the Jews and the Christians have corrupted their scriptures and I have come to correct them, rather than I believe in what is between the hands of the Jews and Christians and then they have to spend hundreds of years telling their believers, never, never, never read what the Jews and Christians say, even though your holy book says over and over again that its own proof of its miraculousness is that it is able to reproduce exactly what is in the hands of the Jews and the Christians. That's what the miracle of the Quran is supposed to be, is it's supposed to exactly match stuff that is in the scriptures that Jews and Christians have. And that's, that's what the Quran says. That's what it says about itself. You wouldn't have your holy book saying stupid things about itself that you have to cover for for years after you, you it would be intelligent it would not be embarrassing it would be relevant to your age and not to the context of this completely stupid prophet so that is it for my presentation uh, can i ask one quick question i'm sorry no no you can't oh. no questions ever yeah, no. you said go ahead i'm sorry i, 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 I got a couple myself still... go ahead I have one quick question. So I was thinking about when you had answered my first question. I appreciate you answering my question. Um, you were talking about how the Arabs sort of developed a system where there, it kind of was taking like a god that already existed within the Air Arabian pantheon and then presenting it as kind of like the Lord God over the other gods. Um, mm -hmm. So I was thinking about, do you feel that this is sort of synonymous to like Egypt with Akhenaten, where Akhenaten kind of did the same sort of like um, mo uh, monotheistic religion where Aten became the sort of like patron god over all the other gods. It is very similar. Um, so a lot of people get confused and think, oh, Aken Akhenaten is some sort of like proto-monotheist or something like that, but he, he really isn't. He has a high god and then the other gods who are below. 
it's really extremely similar to um, uh, Zoroastrianism more than anything else. So in Zoroastrianism, there's an entire class of lesser gods below Ahura Mazda, who are literally, their names like literally mean those worthy of worship. So you do worship them and you worship different ones for specific purposes. But the high god is, is, uh, is Ahura Mazda, who is above all and who is the creator. And really, there was this heavy push towards syncretism before um, that did not exist. And I did, I, on my presentation, I did two presentations on, um, I did a bunch of presentations on the pre-Islamic or religion in Arabia and rock worship and stuff like that. But the two most recent ones on, um, on uh, Hubal, Allah is Hubal. And I talk about Wad and Hubal. And then, uh, like who is Allah? Allah is the moon god and all the lunar connections and everything else. And that also talks about the pagan Hajj um, and how so much of that was just adopted into the current Hajj. It's just a, it's 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 the paganism hit with the monotheistic stick. And it talks about there are these different groups. There's the Hilla and the uh, Hums who are two different groups in the religion of the Mahramun. And the Mahramun are those that HRM, like Haram, those who consider the sacred space to be sacred, right? Um, so people who regard the Kaaba as being a sacred place are called the Mahramun. And they formed their own religious sect among the polytheists and are among all the pagans, right? And the standard ones were the Hilla, who have more kind of a traditional paganism. And then after the year of the elephant, they introduced this new group of like these super special people called the Hums. And actually Hamas has the same root as Hums, by the way, it means zealot. And, and they adopted like additional practices and then applied restrictions on everyone else to like build up their religion as being more and more and more like Judaism or in Christianity in various ways. They they introduced the rule that you can't kill your unwanted daughters anymore. The Hums did that before Muhammad. So they're like, oh, we needed Islam to keep from killing the baby girls. No, the Hums, the pagan Hums already did that. And uh, the Quraysh also said, oh, we are the good, sincere, holy people now we will no longer raid for female slaves to rape. So no more, no more rape slaves, no more raiding for women. We don't do that anymore. And yet Muhammad goes and turns around and undoes that part of the hums. So the hums were better than Muhammad. They probably did that because they were scared after Abraha came through and they thought Abraha was coming to them because they were raiding everybody. And whenever they realized that they escaped, they were probably like, oh, well, now we'll become like, good people and and they won't want to like come and kill us all for raiding and stealing from all the nearby caravans so that seems to be a major part of the motivation to create this huns group but it's so that they want to look legitimate compared to christians so that's really what it was it was that we are legitimate next to this other group we're more genuinely arab we are the nationalist arab religion that truly worships the creator in the correct way and all of this stuff. And then there was a lull. Ethan, does that answer your question? It does. Uh, thank okay. you. That was really right. good, very <laughs> thorough. I'm, I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. I mean, she's a wealth of, of knowledge. I mean, you listen to this woman and for crying out loud, she could talk for an hour on that one subject. It's just the off weird the top stuff. Bread. Well, I'm here's impressed. the thing. Here's the thing. The stuff that's just kind of weird when you read the uh, early biographies and your eyes just kind of cross over like, what is even this? And you just flip to the next page. That's where most of the really important stuff is. That's what gets me. I'm like, oh, that's why this is in there. Like all of this hums and hilla stuff like the first time that i read this you know i just my eyes glazed and they would have these enormously long names of this person son of this person son of this person son of this person did this really obscure thing that i don't care about why is it in here 
and figuring out, okay, this is this tribe and this tribe is related in this way. And this tribe is part of this alliance. And this is why this is written there. Like, it's a lot of work, like taking all of, figuring out why these things are being written and who these weird groups were. So okay. I wanted to point out a couple things uh, yeah. that you that you brought up. Uh, initially, we were talking about Abraham and the tradition of turning out Hagar uh, from Mecca, the, and <laughs> in in two thousand two thousand BC, nineteen hundred, whatever. Abraham's yep. turning out Hagar. Okay, at least fifteen hundred uh, or two thousand five hundred years before Muhammad. Let's say okay. That. So a long time ago in a land far away. The Zamzam well that magically that magically appeared to Hagar. This is after he turned her out, and she's out wandering in the wilderness. The Zamzam well that she happened upon is twenty-one meters from the Kaaba. Yes. Well, why don't it, Muslims put that together? Well, well, she doesn't happen upon it. It's supposed to miraculously burst from the ground, and nothing was there before. But it gets weirder because all of these stories kind of. So what happens with legends is that you get this one little legend here, and then you get this other silly, weird little legend over here, and then you get this other weird little legend over here, and they don't actually fit together because different people made them up at different times. And that's the point. They don't so, fit. So here is, here is the series of events. Event one, in this story, again, Muhammad did not have access to the actual text. So how old is, is Ishmael? He's an infant. He's breastfeeding. And he doesn't, she doesn't get turned out. Uh, Muhammad is with her and then just leaves her there and says, I leave you to the care of Allah. He will take care of you. In a place without any water. And so she sits there. She drinks the water. And then she goes, oh, I can't bear to see my infant die because I don't have milk anymore, because there's no, because uh, I don't have any water. And then suddenly she starts running from the top of the hill to the top of the next hill. And that's also an important point. I've heard, oh, well, they aren't really mountains, so it must not be there. What, but the, the issue is that they're running in the, in the story and also in the, uh, the uh, Hajj, you run from the very, very top of one of these little stone outcroppings to the very top of the other, back and forth, you know, three and a half times, but you climb one of these seven times minimum. It might be eight, depending on how, how Muhammad did it. It's now fenced off, so you can't climb it. But the equivalent of that climb would be climbing Pike's Peak from the base, from where you're allowed to start climbing all the way to the top. That's how much of a climb that would be if it were, for example, the two mountains in Jerusalem that people claim, oh, well, it must be the mountains in Jerusalem because those are real mountains. No, this is clearly something that isn't real mountains because it's done seven times, right? It's something small that people well, can Well, Safa is do 65 feet tall. I had this in a slide, yeah. so I brought it up. Safa is 65 feet tall. Mar was 75 feet tall. And right. they're 450 feet, a football field and a half. Now, apart. of course, it's stupid that she would go back and forth between them because right. this never was done by any. Hagar never did this. It's made up. It's an excuse right. to do something that was a pagan activity of devotion. It was a pagan devotional activity to go from the top of one rocky outcropping to the top of another rocky outcropping. And there had been uh, there had been like idols at each one. And so that was specifically a pagan devotional act. And Muhammad's trying to hit it with a monotheism stick. Well, why do we do this thing, which is so e obviously to go and worship the idols at the tops? And he goes, oh, no, it's because Hagar did this. Mm -hmm. And then the story is that the well gets miraculously provided by Allah. So before it was closed up, and then Allah causes it to flow suddenly and creates it himself. Mm. But they're just left there. What do they eat? Nothing, apparently. Because um, there's no food still. 
because but it's then, a desert. That's yeah. why they don't eat anything. Because there's a desert. There's no food. Exactly. But but the uh, the first story that Muhammad told about Ishmael being there was about Ishmael and Abraham mm -hmm. building the Kaaba. Right. And the whole reason that this was told is because the Jews had just forcefully rejected Muhammad mm -hmm. and said, "We don't believe in you." You're full of it. You're not a real prophet. We don't believe anything you're saying. And he suddenly comes and he, and they said, you are not a real prophet because the Arabs are from Ishmael. He had never even heard of Ishmael. And, but they come out with, you're from Ishmael. That's the other son of Abraham. And all of the prophets come from the line of Israel. and you're not from that line. So before that, he had been saying he is a prophet like Moses. And they pointed out that no, the prophet like Moses has to be from Israel. It says it right here. Um, because he was told that by Wadaka, who, who knew a little bit more than he did. So then he makes up this new thing where he takes the words of the prophet like me. And he puts them in the mouth of Abraham talking about himself and Ishmael. So there will be a prophet who is from among us, who is like us. It even has that double us, like it does in Deuteronomy, uh, or like you and in Deuteronomy 18.15, that they always want to skip over and go straight to 18.18. It has that same double phraseology too. And he puts it in the mouth of Abraham while they are building the Kaaba. So at that moment, he makes up, the idea that Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba and now that's why we're going to face the Kaaba because the Jews have said that we're not from you. Well, I'm saying that Abraham said that there'll be a prophet like Ishmael and he built the Kaaba so we should bow to hit as the first temple or whatever. Like that, that, that's what he's doing. He's, he's creating that. Yeah. I have a question. Can you bring up your last slide, the last point um, yeah. you mentioned? Um, would you call it the Herculean, um, the fully mythological approach where everything in Islam is made up ex post facto? So you reject that kind of thing, right? Yeah, I absolutely do. Okay. Because no one in the history of the world has ever been able to do something like that. What no, you do I, get, I, what, well, what oh, you get right, is sorry. like charismatic leaders who convinced people, just like Mohammed, convinced people of something that happened in the ancient past. The central authority is supposedly teaching people that are like recasting what their own parents and grandparents did. Your parents told you this, but it's not true. Here's the truth. Your grandparents mm. said this. Here's the truth. Now we're going to manufacture new genealogies for all of you, and you're just going to believe it. Well, you, you wouldn't believe that. They were so... Umar and Abu Bakr both forbade people to transmit hadiths. Let me repeat that. People were not supposed to be transmitting a hadith during the reign of Abu Bakr or Umar. Where do you get that information? Uh, if you look at, uh, it, it's, in, it's in the sources. If you look at like uh, history of hadiths or something like that, you can find the quotes. Okay. Um, so yeah, supposedly, you see, Abu you Bakr, who would you say again, Mary? I'm sorry. Uh, here, uh, I, is it, I, here. I, I don't need a, a, a name, I just is this right part here. Of the I just literature? put in a here. Here's the YouTube or a, a Wikipedia link. How about that? During Umar's reign as caliph, hadith were not being narrated by the people. Many sources say it was Umar himself was the first person to ban hadith, and then there are various. Uh, views and, and summaries and stuff. And the reason was because Muhammad's theology radically changed during his life. When you are with someone who's super charismatic and you're in a cult, when they wake up the next day, just like Joseph Smith, for heaven's sake, Joseph Smith right. originally taught uh, uh, modalism, Right. And he kind of taught Trinitarianism for a while. Then he switched to modalism. And then he switched to uh, tritheism and, and to polytheism and all the rest of that. Like he changed, but he was really charismatic and he convinced people that 
all of these things are true <clears throat> and that they definitely don't contradict what he was saying like two weeks ago. Right. And, no, I, I get that. I get that. But, yeah. but, but the thing is, okay, so I, how to put this? Okay. Was there a Mecca? Was there a region? Was there an area? Obviously, they came from somewhere. They came from Saudi Arabia. Well, they came from the Arabian Peninsula. Was there actually a charismatic Muhammad? Absolutely, there, there was. Well, and the there, reason there may have been. Well, well, hold on, hold on. There, there may have been a composite of holy men, uh, because Muhammad is just a title. It just means the praised one. No, it doesn't. Um, so, who tells yeah, you it means that? The who one, told you yeah, that? Muhammad. Yeah, That's it means the it praised means. one or the one worthy of praise, something nope. like that. Okay, what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Let's look. So it's a mouthful, causative form, but it is a mouthful causative form as a noun, as a name. So, for example, you have a name, al Mukira, which is kind of, a, it's a title, right? And its root is to raid, right? It does not mean the raided one. It means the one who makes raids. Okay, well, what does Muhammad mean then? Hang on. Okay, well, <laughs> well, let's find out. Al-Mutalib, Al-Mutalib does not mean the one who is sought. It means the one who is the religion who makes many religious seekings. Wow. Masjid does not mean the place that is prostrated. It means the place of making prostration. prostration. Yes. So Muhammad, following that same pattern, the normative understanding of that would be the one who makes many praises because that, that the shada, that doubling there is mm. an intensification that often means repetition or, or, okay. or, or makes extreme praises. Like he, the one who makes great praise or the one who makes many praises. So it is of a worshiper and it was an ordinary name. Other people are named that who are older than Muhammad, the prophet. Mm, do you have any proof of that? Because so Muhammad, Muhammad, um, Ibn Maslama, and his 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 father's name Mas Maslama was another ordinary name, and it's not the one who is peaced, but the one who makes peace is what that name means. Um, he was a person of so Muslims are trying to trick you. When he says, or they just don't know, they're just they're just suckers, right? Because they get lied to. That oh, Muhammad was given this name because he was this super special. Everybody knew how special he would be, and they turn around like five minutes later, and nobody ever knows that he's going to be a prophet. Everybody's surprised. Muhammad himself thinks he's possessed, and he's trying to kill himself. But somehow, everybody knew he was going to be a prophet, right? Obviously, these both can't be true. Obviously, the one that's made up is that everybody thought he would be a prophet, right? But the fact that other people, it wasn't a common name, it was an uncommon name, but other people were given this name as a birth name. At birth, they were called Muhammad. And now there is a, a story that his name was uh, Qutham because, he, because uh, he was going to be named after a son who had died at birth. Now, here's the interesting thing. There are two different traditions <clears throat> as to who wanted to name him Qutham and who wanted to name him Muhammad. And I actually believe that it was Amina who wanted to name him Kutham. And it was uh, it was his grandfather, Abdul Mutalib, who said, no, he's going to be named Muhammad. And the reason is because his grandfather still had doubts about his paternity. So he's giving him a name that's respectable, but is not the name of his own dead son. Because Amina was making claim, Amina never breastfed Muhammad. Why didn't she breastfeed her own child? So do you know about the uh, law? So she wasn't being financially supported by the family at the time that she gave birth. And by a lot of tradition, she gave birth four years after Abdullah right. died. Right. So what she was doing, she's saying, this is Abdullah's child. And they're saying, <laughs> we're not so sure about that. And she says, I will not feed him because he is his child. And it is his, it is a fam male family's re financial responsibility to give me money to provide for this child. 
in a maher marriage or to provide someone to breastfeed the child in my place. If I am not required legally to feed this child unless I get compensated for it because this is his child. And his family is like, I'm not so sure about that, except for Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab immediately sends his uh, wet nurse slave, Dueba, over there and says, you nurse the baby to make sure that the baby lives. I believe that this is my, my uh, brother's son. So you nurse the baby, you take care of this baby. And Abdul Muttalib is convinced. He takes Muhammad before Hubal. And it just explains a moment before in Ibn Ashaq that the reason that you take babies in front of Hubal is if you doubt their paternity. But then he has him praising Allah as he stands in front of Hubal. Is he really praising Allah or did he take the baby in front of Hubal to have the, uh, the things cast for paternity and to determine whether or not he was actually Abdullah's son? Well, it came up that it was Abdullah's son. And so <clears throat> he still refused to support Amina and he paid for a wet nurse to take the boy out into the countryside instead. And he also, I believe, he refused to have the boy named after his, his dead son as kind of a replacement son, as kind of like, you know, you take care of him, you adopt him with family, you support him, all that sort of stuff. And he gave him a different name that wasn't a family name. And so people were asking, why are you giving him a name that isn't a family name? He's like, oh, it's a very, it's, a, it's an excellent name. You know, it's a religious name. It's a good name, that kind of thing. And so he was taken out for four years before he was finally brought back, before the foster mother was finally like, I'm done with this kid. Here, dumped him back on Amina. And then two years later, Amina, and Amina's in Yathrib. And they said it's to visit her relatives. Do you know how many relatives Amina had in Yathrib? Goose egg, none. She had a stepmother who had, it was only briefly her stepmother before her dad died, who had brothers in Yathrib. But that wasn't her relatives. That's her stepmom's relatives. And she had no business visiting them. So I think that she was like a traveler's wife. And that's like what, what, what she did to support herself after Abdullah died. So she's coming back to uh, Mecca, probably to ask, to say either give me more money for this kid or he's old enough, you can support him for the rest of the time now. And she dies on the way. He ends up going there. He's with his grandfather for only two years and he dies. So he's basically been ripped from the only mother he knew at four. His birth mother dies at six. His grandfather dies when he's eight. So he, of course he's a psychological wreck. So that's, so that, that's but why see, I think he was named Muhammad. Right, uh, okay. Can I, can but, I but see, a here, Ren? Can, can I? Well, well I, but, he hold on. stay till five and we're 50 minutes faster bedtime, so. All right, all right, go ahead. Sorry, Mary. Mary, I, I really appreciate you staying on for the almost the entire show. I, I really do. Um, I, I I had just a couple questions about um, about your dating on all of this. Have Have you read um, Islam in Light of History by a guy by the name of Rafat Amari? Have you read any of his work? Um, I haven't read that, but I have read a fair amount of the uh, what I'll call the revisionist schools. I haven't gotten to that. But I am going to go through all of them and point out their their issues and errors and things because I really think that this does come from a dude named Mohammed who lived in Mecca. It's just that Mecca was a backwater and he was a fraud. And so nobody would mention Mecca because it was a backwater. <clears throat> right, right. Well, it is mentioned in the pre-Islamic poetry, and for a what? Okay, so for there were like three phases. Phase one, everybody took all the poetry as if it's semi-authentic at, at minimum. And then there was phase two where everybody dismissed every single piece of poetry. And now there's phase three where people are distinguishing between the circumstances where forgery was very common and the um, context where it wasn't and noting both the agreement and disagree, like, there are ways in which the poetry agrees with the Quran in which it disagrees with the vast majority of the kind of later Islamic material about what 
the pagans believed, right? So the Quran's accusing pagans of believing certain things. And then you go to some of the sources and you get kind of these odd ideas that are pretty different from that. But then you go to this pre-Islamic poetry and it agrees with that and fits in with certain ways. But it meant, the pre, so, you're saying the pre-Islamic poetry mentions the, the Mecca. By yeah, it mentions, it mentions Mecca. Ne do you know, and do you know what it says about no, who I, built I, I the Kaaba? I guess the first I've heard of this. Go ahead. It says that the Jurham and the Quraysh built the Kaaba. And remember, and in we the, find this is from which source is this? This is uh, pre Islamic poetry, uh, uh, Bone Breaker, Score Settler by Nicholas uh, Sinai. Uh, so lo look at his explanations. I'm not saying that all of it is authentic or hasn't been meddled with, but enough of it is. It matches, and where it doesn't match in some places, it's very uncomfortable for the Islamic narrative. Some okay, of so the, 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 the common mantra is Mecca is not mentioned by name until 741. That's not true then. It is not true if you go to, if you go to the people who are living in this area. It was, it, it was, so... It's not. You know, it's not, say, it's not mentioned in any other literature outside of Islamic literature. It was the hadith? That's you think well, the I mean, hadith they were pagans, or whatever, right? Okay, but it's not mentioned anywhere until 741. That's not true because this well, uh, Nicholas Sinai yeah, in his so, book that cites pre-Islamic poetry so the pre as a pre source of poetry. Yeah. Mecca. The pre-Islamic poetry was kept in oral form because they were not writing people. Until right. it was an oral later culture, on. I get that. Sure. So sure, it was sure. an oral culture, and these are oral traditions that are preserved. Some of these are highly mucked with, some of them are forgeries, but there are certain genres in which there is very little Islamic meddling. Right. And okay. within these particular genres, you can get ideas of things. There are also reports of the Jahaliya. The, the age of ignorance, right, from other places mm -hmm. that have some really, really telling things. For example, we find out why Muhammad is called, uh, why you say Allahu Akbar. What's he greater than? You go to the Talbiya of the pagans and you find out that they said, Allah and al Uzza are great, but Allah is greater. Mm -hmm. That is what that's from. It's from the pagan saying about Allah being greater than the pagan goddesses because he's the the first god and they're just the intercessors you'll find uh and then that matches beautifully with herodotus talking about how they have the go goddess uh uh aliat whom they call the great so there's a lot the great and then Allah is greater. That's where it came from. It came from. But right, if you have um, Allah, Aluza, and Manat, those, yes. those are the the gods of the of Ta of Falmud of that that, that no, of Nabatea no. up in that region. Okay. No, so, no, so that, not exactly. Just... No. So, um, so Nabatea itself appears to have uniquely combined Aluza and well, so there's Ishtar and Ashera. So Ishtar is Venus. Ashera is the mother goddess. Sure. And Nabatea, for some reason, they squashed the two together. And uh, Allah started out as this squashed combo goddess. But then they uh, and they adopted Al Uzza as their high goddess, and she was identical to Allah. So it was just another name for Allah in Nabatea. So they aren't really two goddesses. Wherever um, in, in a particular about town. We're talking about a region in Northern Arabia, not in yes. the Hejaz. Correct, correct. And that's, this that's is something that's unique to, to Nab right. Nabatea alone appears to have completely combined the two. Wherever there's al Usa, there is no Alat. Wherever there is Alat, there is no al Usa. They seem to be names for the same goddess. Um, depending on which town that you Muhammad mean. is referring to when he says that Allah Akbar God what? is greater, my God is greater than. Yeah, and that, those were two of the gods. So outside okay. of Nabatea, they were distinguished again. So Alat is the mother goddess, and Al Uzza is Venus. But in Nabatea, they got wonky for some reason. Then they they don't have that those distinguishing marks. So um, Alat is uh, 
uh, and then Minot got added later. You'll find this part of the the reason that people are saying wrongly that these things are like somehow uniquely of the Hara, the Jordanian Hara and the Araba, that, that, that northern region, is because that's where all the religious writings are. If you go down in the Hejaz, people don't write, they rarely write. And when they write, they're writing like non-religious things. They're writing their names and they're saying that they are remembering someone or yearning for someone, but they don't say with the help of what God. So look, they're just not being very religious in their writing. Okay, I got, I have one more yeah. question, one more question, then we're, we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, okay. So the Mecca, Mecca itself, um, mm -hmm. when we look at all the ancient maps uh, and they list all these, for, for number one, Makaraba was only mentioned one time and that was by Ptolemy. Nobody ever mentions Makaraba after, after, after Ptolemy. Along with tons of other the towns that we could never right identify. and you know and, and you know why and if you're going to say that Makarab is it why isn't this on any other map or is it mentioned by anybody else but the 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 thing that I wanted well, to it didn't make... exist at all at that time like nothing existed there it existed at all as like a waypoint shrine in the three hundreds in the Islamic sources the first time people lived there Islamic permanently sources, is. Yeah. It, is Islamic sources say that saying. Ishmael built a No, 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 no. Listen, listen. According to the Islamic sources, the first time that people built houses there was in the time of Qusay, which is about 430 AD, according to their own chronology. So the Jurham, who later on get assigned this wonderful whatever, they have no permanent buildings. The Khuza'a, the Khuza'a have no permanent buildings. The Qusay, the founder of the Quraysh, have the first permanent building. So there are these extreme contradictions in the Islamic sources. Some are based on the uh, traditional history of Mecca, like Qusay built the first permanent buildings, and some are based on the things that Muhammad farted out of his mouth. Oh, it was built by Ishmael. And they're in contradiction. Right? So, yeah, the, the folks who are saying, oh, it's in Palmyra, Syria. Okay, well, that's not the point I'm trying to make. The yeah. point I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make here is that Mecca being this this major, most important city in all of human history is not does not show up on a map until 900 AD. Any map? Do you know of Mecca appearing on any map? Because you know you you made the the great point. That, you know, it's a very important point to know that this is uh, a very oral culture, and of course they're not going to be. In, number one, there's no tr there's nothing to make paper out of to write anything on in the first place. So of course it's going to be an oral, oral culture. However, well, there do. are, people, there are yeah. people that are supposed to be trading in between that region, namely in Taif, which is, you know, close to where Mecca supposedly is to occur. But nobody on any of these maps, even the ancient trade maps by anybody. Places I don't Mecca think now. Taif appears on one either until then. Uh, Taif, I, I can. Where's, I can get where's the earliest one that it, I think? Well, I think. Wait one second. I think maybe. Uh, did. I have it. Yeah, here. Stephen of Byzantium still didn't know about Taif. Yeah. Because it was it. really small. But there's also, yeah, there's no there's no Taif there either because it's so small and unimportant. It's not that it didn't exist, it's that nobody outside of that, no one who made maps cared about the place or had heard about the place. So that's really the distinguishing thing that no one who is a map maker has heard about or cares about the place until a much later point. So yeah, Mecca is, does have a wadi going through its center. And if you look at where the old buildings were, they were like up on the sides with these big, and they talked about how uh, they would walk in the uh, stream bed and things like that, because it is a very silly place to build anything, but you know, they 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 built things on it and they built things on it later too. They built things on it in times of uh Mu'awiyah or Mu'awiyah and uh 
Abdul Malik and all of the various uh, governors of Mecca tried to improve it and make it look cooler, although it's very embarrassing. Here's the thing. No one, it, if you are going to have a very important temple for your society and you get to choose where it is, you would want to put it in your capital or in a very important trade location to get even more trade there. You don't want to put it in an armpit. And Mecca is like the armpit of the Hejaz. Well, here's okay. Here's here's the hypothesis, and we're gonna we're gonna co- we're gonna go. Uh, is that the Umayyads? Their capital was up in Damascus, and if you are going to formulate a religion and base it upon uh, locations, this is exactly what you would want. This is what you would if you were going to fabricate things, and this is why you know I I I'm gonna you know, admittedly just dis- disagree with you on this. This is what, this is exactly what you would do. You would make up this, this location in an uh, almost a non-existent area. People are very unfamiliar with, and you would develop after you, you know, the, the Abbasids take over uh, a century later, uh, you would develop this tradition, these oral traditions of the Hadith uh, to parallel what the Jews were doing as far as their Talmudic literature was, or their Talmudic practices were concerned. Uh, this this is exactly what you would expect. Um, you know, so, so what I'm, parallels I'm do you have to that to, history? I'm just going to say this. I'm going to look forward to your presentation when uh, over on uh, everybody. If you want to find Mary, she's on reasoned reasons reasoned answers. Uh, it's a YouTube channel uh, with Thaddeus Stevens, and Mary is like. You basically run the channel. I, I you know, I don't. No, to, I, 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 I'm, I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. Yeah, but, but I'm, I'm there every Tuesday, so I'm. Yeah. One of the, I'm the most regular person. And so I see he's got like the score. What is the score thing he's got going at the top? So if of, you're, of it's, his... it, it's based on people who chat, uh, how many points they earn. They can earn points by chatting and stuff like that. So he's written a whole bunch of scripts this? and fun. Who, who monitors so. this? I mean, do you have somebody on the side that monitors and says, no, 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 it's, it's automatic. It's a script. No so. kidding. Oh, that's so we, yeah, we got to get that. We got to use that software. That's pretty cool. We got to get away from the StreamYard stuff, dude. This is like so pandemic StreamYard. Well, it's like easy it's, for me to use, and that's what we need because these guys right here are not big. Right. All right, I'm we're going to call it a day, guys. I got, I'm got. i late for church already. Look what you're doing. Wait, you're doing a, real quick, day. just to let you know, it's heated up. Hezbollah has officially joined the site. Heavy fighting on the northern part of Israel right now. Massive airstrikes going on in Gaza at the same time, according to the Twitter feeds. Okay, no real confirmation yet in the actual legitimate news sources. But I get all my news from Twitter because they seem to post. They seem to actually, the dudes on Twitter actually seem to post up. And then 30 minutes later, you, you see it on the regular news sites. Anyway, massive airstrikes, massive fighting going on right now at the uh, Lebanon um, and um, Israeli border in the north. Um, so pray for Israel. Uh, pray for the destruction of the enemies of God. And, well... Even if you don't would, believe that, just pray for the destruction of these terrorists. Anyway, I would I yeah. would ask people, and I appreciate that, Rad. Um, as far as this conflict going on in Israel, I'd ask people to pray for those people that are in Gaza that are part of Hamas, that the are part of Hezbollah. No, I, I actually that mm-hmm. God would pour His Spirit. The only thing that's can save these people and change their hearts away from this hatred that they, this visceral hatred that they have mm-hmm. for God's people is Jesus Christ. And I was right. asking God's spirit would be poured out on them so they would come to know the true Savior that we have. I'm Christ. okay with that. I'm good with that. Or his wrath. Either way, I'm, I'm fine. But point <laughs> being is this, okay? It's really heating up. It's starting to get serious, uh, scary. Poor Steve and his friends out trapped in Gaza. Not Steve. He's not trapped there. But in, also his family in the West Bank. This is very hairy stuff, man. So pray for the people. Pray that you know the Christians are safe. You know the, the, the you know the, the the church is safe, and you know whip out the can of whip ass on the Hamas. I'm just saying. I'm just you know whatever. Okay. Uh, Put the Mary, clothes. Mary, I really appreciate you spending your afternoon uh, with us. I know you're a mama. You got kids, and uh, you're busy with Thaddeus and that. So we really appreciate you coming on here and sharing with us the uh, what, what you have on Ptolemy. 
Mecca and its origins. Um, I'm going to try to see if I get Thaddeus on here someday too, because uh, he's he's kind of a bank of knowledge. I'm just going to. I mean, if if I was going to ask Thaddeus to come on, what topic does he enjoy the most? Do you think? Um, probably he he probably just likes explaining uh, Old Testament theology and how Old Covenant and New Covenant and what the Old Covenant means and what its purpose was and everything else. Okay. Well, well, so, actually, next week's topic is the Trinity in the Old Testament. So uh, yeah. I'll, I'm going to send him an email. And All right. See what he has to say. All right. Everybody that was in chat today, thank you for coming. I appreciate you. I know you guys can be doing all kinds of other things on your Sunday evening. Uh, and we will see you next week on the Cross and the Crescent. Cold close, cold close. I'm closing with advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that the Muslims were riding against one another. And as much as we don't want to face the fact, the Muslims were lying sometimes. They were fabricating, they were embellishing, and that might be hard to accept, but that is a reality.